I do some consulting work on American the feeling in the room was You powerful. don't ever say to her that what about the shower coins? She doesn't have a discussion on the ethical we laugh. It's more of a community. We're trying to back up currently doing in autism. USA Today says he is the closest thing to a rock star in the graphic design world. Chip Kidd is a graphic designer for Alfred A. Knopf Publishing and a Penn State alumnus. Among his many creations is the iconic T-Rex skeleton for Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, which became one of the most seen images of the 1990s. We'll talk with him about the design process, the future of the book publishing industry, and about his award-winning novel, the Cheese Monkeys, which is loosely based on his years at Penn State. Here's our conversation with Chip Kidd. Chip Kidd, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Chip Kidd is, is your real name. How, well, how, how lucky was that? It's real-ish. Um, my legal name is Charles Kidd, but uh, when my mom was had me in the womb, and they didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl, but... She decided if it's a boy, and it, it'll be Charles, and we'll nickname him Chip. Uh, so, and it's worked it well. Yes, when I came to New York, everyone thought I made it up. You went to New York in 1986 after graduating from Penn, Penn State, State. Yes, and really, you ended up in this magnificent career by accident. You totally, wanted yeah. you wanted to work for one of the big design firms in New York City, and instead ended up. Uh, at one of the subsidiaries, uh, basically, of, of Random House. Tell us the story uh, about the very first book design project you ever got. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I mean, I was barely 22 and sort of backed into this job of being assistant to the art director at Alfred A. Knopf, which is, which is, I mean, considered one of the jewels in the Random House crown. I mean, it really is a, an amazing publisher. And I just, you know, I just wanted a job. <laughs> and um, so entry level, you, you do uh, a lot of stuff that, that isn't really designed. And of course, bef we weren't computerized then, so you were doing it all by hand. Um, really, the first book cover that has my name on it is an utterly nondescript. Uh, it's um, it's a, f a f how to photography manual by a guy named John Hedgeco. And that's because uh, you're actually your first design was rejected. Yes. How to how to work for a boss? How, how to work, how for, to work a jerk. for a jerk? Yes. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yes. That was. Uh, <laughs> I just think that's just the greatest first project. <laughs> I know, I know, and uh, yeah, it, uh, this wonderful um, art director at Vintage uh, um, gave me a shot and and gave me a freelance book cover to do, and it was How to Work for a Jerk, and it was a self-help book for people who hate their bosses. <laughs> and I did this design that looked like a like a an EC horror comic because I'm a big comic book fan and uh, you know it's like creepy and eerie and drippy letters and stuff and uh, it basically it cracked them up and that's about it um, but the the art director at Knopf had seen it and thought it was amusing and I then I went in and showed her my portfolio and she needed an assistant so. And 28 late years later, almost, and, mm -hmm. and now you are the associate art director at Knopf, among uh, uh, so many other things, mm -hmm. a book author, mm -hmm. a public speaker, mm -hmm. uh, you name it. Uh, you say one of the reasons you're a graphic artist and not a fine artist mm -hmm. is because you suffer from something that, that you call uh, black canvas syndrome. You, you need an assignment. Yes, um, and that was something that I figured out here at Penn State very early on. Um, there's, a, there act, uh, there's a wonderful graphic design program here. It's still run by the same guy, Lanny Simis. And, um, and again, I sort of backed into that too. I knew I wanted to major in art. But uh, I, frankly, I had the right guidance counselor whose name I can't remember said, well, maybe you should try this thing called graphic design. And um, it was totally the, the, the right decision. But, um, but I, didn't, I didn't really know exactly what it was. But I, I, it, it, I knew it was creative and uh, something that involved pictures and words and, and something that uh, you could maybe make a viable Living ca career at. at. But, um, you know, <clears throat> uh, the idea of, of 
being, you know, taking a painting class and being given a blank canvas and just say, you know, do whatever you want. I just, I don't have that particular, what I would call creative gene. Um, so I liked, I liked the fact that graphic design was very much assignment based. You wrote in a book, your, your very first novel, which, which I should say turned out to be quite a success for a first novel and for someone who didn't start off at, as with a passion as a, as a writer. Right. Uh, and you write in this book, uh, The Cheese Monkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of the, the book begins with the narrator's assessment of Penn State's art major. Majoring in art at the State University appealed to me because I have always hated art. And I had a hunch if any school would treat the subject with the proper disdain, it would be one that was run by the government. Of course, I was right. But at the end of the day, you can't major in making stuff. So it was art by default. How much of that is you talking? <laughs> I mean, actually, the question is, how much of that is me being a, you know... A smart Alec. Smart Alec. <laughs> um, a lot, you know. I, but it, I, it's, it's, it's so interesting to go, because I go to a lot of schools, and I, I was just at Kansas State University last week and visiting and lecturing and, and seeing, like, you know, they're all different and they're all the same. You know, the, 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 the smells and the sights and the... <clears throat> you know, you see, you just, you just, I mean, they're, they're kids, they're, they're studying, you see a lot of bad art. And uh, <laughs> it, it can, it's just kind of, it's just kind of amusing. But it's also, it's just, it's part of the learning process too. So, um, I mean, really the, the, I think the narrator, I mean, a lot of it is me, but he also has a lot of deep seated insecurity and, and some of that is uh, filtered out through through being sarcastic or, or, or turning your nose up at everything. And, and that insecurity, is that part of the real Chip Kid? I oh mean, God, even, yes. I mean, someone who, uh, I, I just feel like you have uh, just such a reputation to uphold. <laughs> Uh, you've been called, you know, a rock star in the book design industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was uh, James Elroy, the world's greatest book jacket designer. Well, that's the uh, James is a friend, and uh, I think he's great, and we've worked together on a what well, worked together. I've done a lot of book covers for him, um, and he, but he tends to um, use a lot of hyperbole. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, you've done. I don't know if I would take his word for it. You've done at this point 1,500 book covers Something and like counting. Mm -hmm. uh, John Updike, David Sedaris, Augustine Burroughs, Michael Crichton, mm -hmm. James Elroy, mm -hmm. Oliver Sacks. Mm -hmm. What was the most difficult assignment you've ever gotten? Well, at this point, after doing this for so long, um, there's quite a few of them. I think um, one freelance job I got was to basically redesign the Bible, <laughs> uh, more specifically the New Testament. I actually saw that cover. And uh, a face on the side. Yes, and uh, that I mean, that was quite a sort of kerfuffle because um, it, the photo was by Andre Serrano, uh, who had done a very controversial piece of art in the late '80s um, uh, that sort of br almost brought down the NEA because it was. Um, it was a picture Inflammatory. of... Inflammatory. It was uh, the crucifix immersed in a glass of his urine. own urine. So, uh, but this was not that. This was, um, this was something that called the Morgue Series, and uh, it really was, it was a dead face um, with the eye open. And uh, so it was It's sort a of, photograph that sticks with you. Yeah, I mean, but it was, it became guilt by association. The... Uh, the publisher was very sort of brave to go with it, and uh, it was reviled by just about everybody. Um, I felt you know, I felt bad for them, but I, I was I was proud of it as a as a design. And then, but certainly trying to um, design covers for your own books is is uh, I find very difficult. I want to talk about your own books, but I first want to talk about. What what goes into the designing process for you aside from reading the book, which obviously you do? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's very organic. It's very intuitive. Um, I I think uh, personally, for me, living and working in New York City is very important in terms of 
the visual stimulation and going to museums and galleries and having friends who are artists and constantly seeing um, all this kind of material. Um, and then uh, studying the history of graphic design, which for me was crucial. And when I was a senior here, they had just introduced a history of graphic design class, which I took. And that, that is, that's one of my main um, suggestions uh, to students. Um, and, and a lot of the schools do it now anyway, but uh, it, it, that is quite crucial, is knowing what was, what's been done and why and, and uh, the different kinds of approaches of, you know, it's really quite, uh, there's a lot that you, you know, if you're, if you're doing it right, you never stop learning. You've been credited with basically spawning a revolution in, in the book designing, book jacket designing uh, industry. Uh, and, and your work has been described as smart and witty and unpredictable. And it, and it made me wonder, when is the last time you surprised yourself <laughs> with, with a project <laughs> where you thought, wow, where did that come from? Uh. I mean, I guess it happens a lot. I'm trying to think of the last. I remember um, I was doing a cover for David Sedaris called Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. And that was uh, one where I had, think I'd done like four or five designs. And they were not... Chilling. <laughs> right. And... Uh, and I mean, the, the part of the great thing, I think, uh, is working on like 10 different projects at once. Um, and, and not, usually with books, the deadline isn't so hectic. And I was researching for another project and I came upon an image that finally I realized was right for the, for the Sedaris thing. And, and it, everybody agreed. And so that kind of serendipity, I think you have to really be, you know, on the lookout and on your, on your toes. And Let, let's talk about your own book, The Cheese Monkeys. Okay. Uh, your first novel, mm -hmm. you sell 50,000 copies, which is to me absolutely remarkable for a, a first time novel. Well, and also a first time novel that I think is very hard to sort of categorize and, and uh, anyway, sorry. It, well, it's loosely based on, on your years at Penn State. Yes. It's basically told in two semesters. Yes. A uh, and for anyone who's from Penn State, they're going to recognize the Creamery, the creamery and the Rathskeller and, and right. Uncle Eliza's Uncle Irby's, right, I believe right, it right. is. Um, you know, I, I had an extraordinary education here and um, I majored in graphic design from 1982 to 1986 and I had uh, more than two but mainly two extremely strong teachers a guy named Bill Kinzer and Lanny Samis who's still there and um, I can't really remember what inspired me to, to, to fictionalize it but the the critiques, I mean, they were very, very intense teachers, very smart, very volatile. But there was always a reason, you know, and uh, for everything they were saying. It wasn't just abuse. It was like, oh, come on, you know, think better and work harder. That critique thing is even in your second book, The, the Learners. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of wondering, is critiquing, you know, on one hand praising and on the other hand critiquing another person's work almost an occupational hazard? Mm -hmm. My guess is you can't look at anyone's book cover without really analyzing it. I think that's true. I think that's true. I think uh, most good graphic designers sort of can't help themselves in that way, you know identifying typefaces and things like that. Um, I always found, um, what, what would you call it? I, not negative reinforcement, but um, I, did, I didn't, it's not that I loved criticism, but I wanna, I'm much more interested in my weaknesses and trying to make them stronger than in just being told that what I do is great all the time. And, and certainly in school, I, you know, I was there to learn. And so I, you know, yeah, I didn't, 
like being some told that what I did was crap or whatever. But it, but it's like okay, why and how, and how can we then move forward and do something better? Well, here was a book that I thought must have been a really interesting project, Vladimir Nabokov. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who, who, who may not remember, he died in 1977. He's the, the Russian author best known for Lolita and, and Pale Fire. And you got the assignment uh, in, 19, in 2009 of designing a book cover for someone who died and said, I want any remaining manuscripts destroyed. And Vladimir uh, Nabokov's wife struggled with this, then she died, the son right. was left to it, and finally decided to, uh, to publish it. Right. So here you are publishing something that the will basically states, don't publish it. Mm -hmm. What you did with it, uh, you know, a black cover with white print, or, uh, just a thin red line, and the, the words, the text is fading off the page. Mm -hmm. On one hand, this book cover was called Ingenious, a triumph of the bookmaster's art, and on the other, little more than a gimmick that would have, quote, disgusted the author. Wow. <laughs> Whew. All right. Um, I mean, first of all, he's one of my favorite authors, authors duh, and, and, and certainly one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. Um, and I mean, for the record, I didn't just design the cover, I designed the entire book. And, and, the, and the question was, how to present this because it wasn't really a manuscript. He Correct. he, it was 128 note cards, cause index that's, cards, index cards, because that's how he would start. That's how he'd figure out his book. And so he, but he was very much, you know, doing this in his last days. So um, it wasn't anywhere near any kind of even. I mean, it's coherent for a while, and then it just sort of all breaks up because that's the way he worked, and then and then he died. So he he did on his deathbed say to his son Dimitri, you know, burn it, uh, which Dimitri did not do, and he he uh, struggled with it. He struggled with it, but you know, the, also by by some accounts, um, Nabokov told his wife Vera to burn Lolita too. Um, so. You know, I. So, these cards. It, the the project was going to be called the um, the original of Laura. And uh, so the cards were in a safe in Montreux for years and years and years and years. Safe and, deposit box. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, Nabokovian scholars would sort of whisper about: Do they exist? Do they not exist? And what do they say? And etc. And for some, I don't. I can't really say why, because now. Alas, Dimitri's dead too, but um, he wanted to publish them. So my approach, I thought, was, okay, we're not, we're not publishing a novel. We're publishing an artifact. And because he was who he was and did what he did, I think it's important. I mean, you can see the, his working process. Um, you actually made perforated index cards in the book so that someone could take the index cards out and, and change, rearrange and the story the themselves. Order. Yeah. Which I thought was ingenious. I mean to me there was that was the only way to uh, to it, it made the most sense to me. Tell us a little bit uh, a little bit about your process. You read the book, but you also get on the phone with the author and say I'm thinking this, how does that sound to you? Well, I'm happy to get on the phone with the author. Um, and sometimes the publisher likes that and sometimes um, they don't like it as much because they want a measure of control. Um, but what I'm not a good, what I'm not good at is like pitching an idea. If I get on the phone with an author, I'll talk to them about, okay, I, I just let them talk. Why did you write this book? What you know? Where are you coming from? Do you have any thoughts about what it should look like? Um, and you know, there's so the author. They're all different. I mean, some have very strong ideas. Some just want to tell me about writing the book and what it meant to them, and and uh, and then I'll maybe get an idea from that. Um, but I remember one notable uh, situation was Augustine Burroughs called me um, about uh, 
his new, he had just changed the title of, of his new um, collection of essays and wanted to know what I thought. And he said the title is Possible Side Effects. And you just have a hand. Uh, well, it's not just a hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I got the, I, I really got the idea instantly. And I, I said to him, I couldn't help myself. I said, oh my God, I know exactly what it should be. And he said, what? And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. And I could have. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'd much rather show than, than tell because that's what, that's what book covers do. Uh, and of, of course, the, 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 the gimmick was it, it was a hand, just basically very directly presented. But then, you, then if you, after a split second, you realize it has six fingers instead of five. There's a lot going on, even, well, even I, when almost nothing appears to be going on. Well, if, I, if I'm doing my job right, that's, I think that's true. One of, your, uh, one of your favorite book covers, and it surprised me, um, is the book cover for A Million Little Pieces. Again, it's a hand, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's covered with what looks like those cake or cupcake jimmies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, of course, the, the memoir by, by uh, James Frey uh, became a scandal. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about that book cover that you like so well? Well, first of all, um, it's not yours. We should it's say. not it's not mine, but it, it's the the guy who did it, who's brilliant and is now at Farrar Strauss and Giroux, was one of my students at School of Visual Arts. His name's Rodrigo Rodrigo Corral, and but and but frankly, that's kind of neither here nor there. The design itself, I thought, was brilliant. First of all, because it violates it violates one of the first rules, which is you know like in the TED talk with the apple and the word apple and people, don't people can look that right. up. You know, th the idea of a million little pieces and then literally showing a million little pieces, um, that was something that was frowned upon in school. That, you know, there should be, there should be some kind of connect that you have to make between a, the words and the image and, and, the, and the words should not be directly describing the image. You know, we should be smarter than that. And yet, the way it's done is very, very compelling. So you sort of, it transcends that. So there, that's the one thing. And then the other thing that I thought was brilliant was that um, it survived post-scandal. And, you know, the, the, the issue was, well, this was supposed to be a memoir. Now we, he's admitting he made most of it up. So it's fiction. So it's fiction. And, but the jacket was the only aspect of that book that maintained its dignity as far and, as I was concerned. And who doesn't remember it? Exactly, exactly. In school, one of your teachers said, see what everyone else is doing and then do something completely different. Yes. That, that has served you well. I, you know, I, it, that, in a way, it's just kind of common sense. It, that was Bill Kinzer. Um, and I liked the way um, I mean, in a school that's this big, and we all know how big it is, um, and even in the 80s it was huge, uh, it, it, you, the graphic design department here gr graduates 18 kids a year. So there's this whole process of, of, of getting into the program, and then once you are in, you you're, you basically all sort of semi live together. Um, they, they, we had what we called then the cubicles, and and uh, again, this was pre-computer, but you know, people, and it was open twenty four seven, and and you know, w when we were really under deadline, everybody's there all the time, and but that really was a it, so so you could see what other people were doing is the point. And um, and that just that's just actually creative common sense because um, you don't want to you don't want to copy somebody else. Before the iPad came along, you were highly skeptical that this reading books on a screen would really take off. That is correct. A and I think uh, I think you've seen that more and more people are doing it. So I I'm really curious to know what you think the future of the of bound pages of ink on paper really is. Well, I definitely think that there is a, a future to it. I th what the, the other question I get a lot is, um, you know, how is this going to affect your design process? Because that's really my role in in all of this, and the answer is not at all. I mean, um, 
And, you know, since 1992, all these covers originate on the screen in the first place. Um, I think, you know, what we, we're seeing something very much in transition. Uh, there are still lots of people that like ink on paper. And I, and uh, where I think it, it, it's going to affect it more is, is books that you would not necessarily keep, uh, the phone book, um, uh, or something like an encyclopedia, which takes up a lot of room and, frankly, needs to be updated all the time. Uh, but, you know, I, I also, from the beginning, I was very much um, about making a book as an object, as a thing that you want to have. And, and you say it's one of the few things, few luxuries we can still afford. Yeah, <laughs> right. Chip Kid, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Chip Kidd. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find additional video from this interview. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.